I'm just going to get right to it. This is Walter Angerer. Walter is the Senior Vice President and General Manager for Quest's data protection business. And uh, soon to take the stage is Bob Mazur. Bob is the Vice President of Research and Development. Um, so well, we like Bob. <laughs> <laughs> so Bob is the one at the helm. So we'll take soon. <laughs> just a real quick overview of what we're going to do. Walter's going to give a quick overview. <coughs> for those of you who may not know, kind of talk to you about where Quest is, what we do as a company dive into a little bit about where we've been as a data protection vendor, but we're going to spend most of the time talking about uh, new technology we're bringing to market That's right. very shortly. So with that, I'll just turn it over to Walter. And thanks. Well, thanks, session. everybody. I really appreciate you guys taking the time. I know it's getting late in the day and we're running behind, but we're still going to try to use all 45 minutes because we've got really exciting stuff for you guys to see, and we want to make sure we get enough time for the demo Bob is going to drive. So the important stuff comes from Bob. If you go to the next slide. I just wanted to uh, talk quickly about Quest software. We are sometimes not as known as many of the other companies. We're about a billion dollars in revenue, so not that small anymore, but still we're not that known. So if you go to the next slide, just quickly, what we do. Quest is a company that does a lot of different things in the data center, and they're all focused around simplifying the world, the world of the data center administrators. There's tools that we provide, there's management capabilities we have, there's protection, there is all kind of different things we're gonna talk about here for just a brief moment. But it's all about, we wanna simplify the world in a decent. We recognize the complications we have there today and then we see opportunities to simplify in that. If you go to the next slide, those are the six uh, solutions areas which Quest is currently involved in. Data protection is the one I'm gonna talk about. It comes at the end. We start off with database management. Some of you might know Toad. If you are somewhere in the Oracle world attached, you know Toad. That's what Quest is really known for. It's the biggest part of Quest, and it's one of part of the database management. We have user workspace management. That's actually a couple of solutions that really focused around managing your experience as an end user. So it's about <coughs> virtualized endpoints. It's about desktop management, mobile IT, stuff of that nature. This is really a little bit outside of the data center wall where the actual consumer sits. Uh, Windows Server Management is really something, if you're into Microsoft, you know us from migrations over Active Directory, over SharePoint Exchange, lots of great values in that area. Identity Access Management is a recent addition to it that came through a couple of acquisitions Quest has done in the recent history, and it's really there to help you secure your environment, you know, deal with um, super user access, things of that nature. Um, performance monitoring, also well-known product of Quest, Foglight, so many of you probably have heard about this, is around application performance management, monitoring of the entire environment. And most important for me, data protection. <laughs> That's obviously is the newest addition to the family, and we are probably not as known in the data protection space as we should be, but you might know some of the companies that led up to this. If you go to the next slide, this is a history of acquisitions that makes up the portfolio we're going to talk about. And some of those names <coughs> might ring a bell, like the Vision Core acquisition. Probably many of you know VRanger, came out of the Vision Core acquisition. And probably some of you remember Backbone. Now, Backbone has some really interesting technology, but really wasn't that successful penetrating the market. It's now part of Quest, it's now coming into the portfolio, and going together with other assets, they came really out more of the Windows side and of the database side. So there's a strong portfolio that comes out of the core Quest competency around applications, around databases, which we are bringing now into the space of data protection and allowing us really to go a little bit beyond the storage view of the world into the application view of the world. So that's kind of what Quest is all about. But I don't want to spend too much time on that. We've got some exciting news to come. Can you go to the next slide? Just giving you an idea of what we are talking about in terms of products. You know Quest Network is coming out of the backbone acquisitions with all of the assets from regular heterogeneous backup to CDP to deduplication to bare metal recovery, what you usually see in terms of an enterprise uh, backup application. VRanger came out of the vision core acquisition, heavily focused on virtual environments. And down here is where we get very different to what you usually see from data protection vendors. Lightspeed being the SQL asset around protecting SQL databases and very important recovery manager, really deep, deep application integration, allowing you to really recover Exchange, Active Directory, SharePoint, down to very granular items very fast. CIOs frequently refer to it as the undo for the little uh, mistake they had. So it's very efficient. You don't have to bring back the full image, it's just 
find the little piece that's broken and repair your environment, get up and running very fast. Okay, next slide. This is what I want to talk about. We have gone through a lot of thinking of what are the problems today in backup, right? We, we've seen Gartner reports two years in a row where, where Dave Russell is saying backup is broken, the future of backup is no longer backup, you talk to other analysts, we hear a lot about frustration in the user base about the way they're doing backup today. We really took a step back and said, you know, what's really causing this problem? What's all this frustration about? Where's it coming from? And lots of it has to do with the complications, with the complexity you have in your backup, the kind of effort it takes you to get your backup up and running, configure it right, maintain it. And this is really what we wanted to address. So what we're going to talk about today is a thing we call NetVault XA. It's a new platform. And this new platform is actually going to sit on top of all of our data protection assets eventually. In the first release that's coming out here um, later this year, it's going to be a unified portal or platform into the NetVault backup asset, the NetVault smart disk, as well as ViewAngel. But it's not just a single pane of glass or some sort of user experience or portal. It's a real platform with a lot of intelligence to it. And it really changes the way the user is going to interact with this data protection system. And that's what we're going to introduce today. So I'm going to make a claim here for a moment. If you think of current data protection products, including NetVault and anything else I can think of, they came from a perspective where we were all focused around protecting infrastructure. I've been in backup space for six years. We grew up with physical environments going to tape. What we've done there was we basically looked at there's a physical server in the rack, and we're going to send this off to a tape infrastructure. So we're all focused on the infrastructure. So when you look at the data model that goes with the data protection product, when you look at the policies, they talk about servers they are protecting, and you configure a policy to say, okay, server foobar needs to be protected twice a day going to this destination, right? Well, that's fine, as long as it makes sense to you, as long as you're knowledgeable enough to know what FUBA is really about, what protection layer it should have, and what it does. The other thing is, you're managing really bad policies. So the way you need to describe to the data protection software today, what you need to do is the language of the policy, not necessarily the way somebody who is not a backup admin thinks about this problem. And the other thing is, you need to know a lot about backup to really make it work well. And what I mean by that is there's so many complexities in there depending on which network connectivity you're going to look at, which kind of backup technology you're going to use. Is it an incremental? Is it a full backup? Are you doing source side duplication? There's many, many options you can choose, right? And it's all going to impact the results you're going to get out of it. And at the end of the day, there is no real warning or indication from the systems today whether or not what you configured from how you take the data off the primary host and get them to your backup storage will actually get you to where you want to be. This is something you learn over time, you figure out, you know, this D2 box can do this much, so I'm going to load it up to this, and so on and so forth. And once you look at the reports, they're very cryptic as well, because they're reflecting the view the data protection software has <coughs> about your problem today. It's going to report you back, Fuba had a successful backup today, which means nothing to me unless I know what Fuba does. What we want to look into is taking a different approach. We want to go away from protecting infra infrastructure. We want to go into protecting IT services. At the end of the day, what we worry about is my email service, my transactional database, <coughs> my financial systems. Whether they are hosted in the cloud, whether they're running on a virtualized environment, or they run on a physical host, or all of the above to make up the entire system, it doesn't matter. This is what you really need to protect. The other thing we want to do is we want to talk about SLAs. At the end of the day, if you go to your CAO, they don't care about the policy. I have a service level agreement or even worse, a service level expectation. And that's really what you want to manage. But we don't express it that way in the interface and the way you interact with the system. And XA is going to change that. So we're going to show you how we're going to use XA, how we're going to try to really bridge the gap between what my expectation is. My expectation is I have a financial system, and I want to protect it to a certain service level. And now I'm going to have to find out what infrastructure is it sitting on and how do I wire it. And the best report I can get out of is I have a good backup or not. What we have in SA today and XA today is we have logic built into that in the first release that's going to try to validate that what you're trying to build is going to give the result you're looking for. So when you will, in the demo we'll see, when you try to specify a certain service level agreement, it will gray out certain options based on its intelligence about the infrastructure you're trying to use to get there. For example, if you have a certain target media that can't live up to the expectation, it's going to grade out for you and say, you know what, 
Based on what we know about this device, this is not going to work for you. So don't use it, but you can override it. Down the road, we want to get into a stage where we get more intelligent about it. And based on your desire you described to the XA platform, it's going to choose for you what it thinks is the best way to implement it based on what it knows of your environment. And Bob is going to explain to you in great detail how the magic is going to work. Oh, good, because otherwise I have to interrupt. <laughs> okay, wonderful. So hold your thought for a moment. We'll get there. Go to the next slide. Just want to show you a little bit here, and this is really a slide Bob usually talks. This is a high-level idea of what XA is going to do, and then we're going to get right into a couple of graphical slides and the live demo. So do you want to talk about this real sure, quick? Sure, absolutely. So let me just give some perspective here. There's three major mm -hmm. components to, to XA, and I'll just walk from the top, and I'll just walk down to the, uh, to, to the bottom. So in the top, we're really looking at new access points. We don't want to just target specific tools to provide uh, data protection to the user that sits in front of the IT admin that sits in front of the PC. We want to ensure that it's available for the tablet, it's available for the smartphone. So it's serving multiple form factors, multiple access points, just recognizing a lot of the dynamics that today, today's users uh, are challenged with, multiple roles that they're wearing, and the fact that they're mobile. So uh, we're looking at uh, a number of form factors uh, in terms of supporting access to the UI and the user experience as well as command line interface and a lot of third party in integration. So as Walter had mentioned, when we're uh, really looking holistically at data protection, we're recognizing that it extends beyond just the private infrastructure. So extending beyond the private to the public, uh, organizations that have hybrid. So integration become a very critical staple uh, in terms of allowing you to drive the SLA and then subsequently the policy-based uh, data protection that you require. Uh, moving from the top down to the bottom, is just the portfolio of uh, a set of products. But as Walter had indicated, we want to leverage the IP that we've got in our existing products. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We don't want to try to disassemble necessarily all the products, but we recognize some of the products have shared components. Job scheduling, catalog management as an example. Uh, we want to ensure that we're pulling the best of breed out of how we deal with some of those shared components into common components that effectively plug into a bus and they really fuel the core middleware for the NetVault XA architecture. And in addition to that, taking advantage of the unique feature functionality in established products like vRanger, NetVault Backup. So we're in a sense uh, wrapping adapters or web service, you know, web service interfaces around the existing products, exposing the functionality, all the administrative control, the access to, you know, to the data that these products essentially retain and making those products essentially allowing them to plug into the ecosystem. So they plug into the bus, the existing, sh the additional shared components that we're extracting like job scheduling or for example, new components like uh, you know, LTO, LTFS uh, services or common hypervisor type services. You know, today vRanger is very strong in VMware but we recognize you know, Hyper-V, KVM, Zen as well. And we want to take the best breed, the common denominator functionality for managing or providing data protection in that, you know, that virtualization type of environment and extract it into a common hypervisor shared service. So whether you're in private or whether you're dealing with, with the public, we're able to, again, provide you that SLA and that policy-based protection uh, top down. The cloud gateway, as I move up into the middle piece uh, in the middleware, uh, is really where a, a lot of the platform or the framework exists uh, with core components, optional components. So uh, some of the things that I had indicated already, scheduling, rules engines to uh, enforce uh, various policies tied to the SLAs, uh, as well as analytics, dashboard, on-demand, scheduled type of reporting. Uh, and then the cloud gateway being a key piece, and we'll talk more about this in a bit, but recognizing you know, the nature of hybrid type type you know, in infrastructures today, uh, we want to look at not only data, bi-directional replication of data and databases, but also of full, full stack you know, VMs, regardless of the individual ver you know, hypervisor that resides within the private environment. So uh, extending the reach of the SLAs and the policy management out into the, the public cloud as well as the private cloud and, and really facilitating that by some components that plug directly in the bus and are part of the Net NetVault XA architecture. Is that bus and API then? Is that what well, it, uh, you know, yeah. technically it's not. I mean, really, if you think about it from a technical point of view, it's an enterprise service bus that's bundled into a package that becomes an optional component in the existing products. 
So if you think of uh, you know, a traditional ESP exposing a number of different options in terms of the type of interfaces that you can leverage in order to talk to it, consume information on the bus, publish information. So for example, our V-Ranger product, you know, the way that it's ultimately going to be connecting to the bus is that it's self-describing. So it has a set of existing JSON RESTful interfaces that connect up to, uh, to Mule, which is the ESP that we're using. And then it publishes information about itself as a data protection component or data protection product. And then in addition, it also publishes not only what it can do, but it's associated information related to the VCs, the VMs, we're, you know, what we, we're referring to from an ITIL speak, is the configuration items. So the, you know, the, the source configuration items that you're wanting to protect, as well as the target configuration items like repositories, VTLs, tape libraries, things of that nature that are available to use by that component. And then the bus has a metadata and it has an underlying repository. And then it's able to essentially manage our license, manage the registration of the protection products, and then expose that capability up into the user interface that we're going to give you some visibility to. So today. does that mean that you're going to expose it to web services kind of RESTful APIs so that I can tie into my other orchestration and say, I just created this VM, create this backup policy for it as well? A absolutely. In yeah. fact, if you, if you follow what uh, Dave Russell was talking about in December at the, uh, the, the Gartner infrastructure. We have a rule against mentioning Gartner. Got it. <laughs> Somebody mentioned it at a conference in December. I appreciate it. <laughs> Nobody warned me after the first time. So, um, so we're really looking at it as an orchestration Usually platform. Usually, we throw things we're being polite. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, our, it's, our, it's our first opportunity to get together. So, um, it's really an orchestration platform. So, if you think about it in the spirit of what you just mentioned, yeah. NetVault XA is providing the ability to orchestrate your data protection based on the underlying components of your license, what's been ultimately registered to the middleware, and then essentially the environment that you're trying to protect. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's let's move on because the exciting thing is yet to come. <laughs> so I just want to give you a little bit of a feeling for the departure from where we've been to where we're going and the difference that we want to make here. If you go forward, just want to show you, oh, that doesn't come up too well, but some of you, if you're not familiar, I just wanted to show you the current user experience, right? And I want to really contrast that to what you're about to see because I believe it, it is really available um, to remember. This is the current user experience on the VRanger platform. VRanger is very much modeled after the ESXi console, has a very similar look and feel, was really tailored towards. Uh, the ESX, the VM admin that really knows uh, the way around in ESXi, and so they have a similar experience here. <coughs> and before I go any further, I want to point out all of those existing user experiences, UIs, interfaces will exist in parallel to XA. So when we talk <coughs> about XA and you feel like somebody might get lost in there or might not find what they look, those things will be maintained. They don't go away. This is really an additional thing. Going to the next slide here, this is Netflix Backup. Network Backup, like I mentioned, is a heterogeneous system, so it runs on Unix systems, runs on Linux, runs on almost anything. Therefore, it has a very classic, kind of the old-style Unix interface. It was never my favorite. Yeah, <laughs> yeah unfortunately. <laughs> mine, not mine either. So go to the next slide. And um, Smartlist definitely had the ultimate user experience. We had only a CLI interface to it. So that's, that's where we're coming from, and that's why we believe it's really exciting for our customer base as well as for new customers to see what's coming up. Remind us what Smartdisk does. Smartdisk is kind of the disk gateway for NetVault to attach to disk media. So it's a little bit like an open storage kind of a gateway, not yeah. just very proprietary, right? Should you go on? So this is what we think next generation backup is going to look like. One is we're going to create a couple of different dashboards and, and really views into your entire environment. Keep in mind, XA is going to sit on top of multiple instances of NetVault, VRanger, Lightspeed, and all your assets in many different data centers. So it's not tied to a single instance. And what we try to do is we try to provide more value than just being able to troubleshoot your backup or configure it but actually give you a view into your system that's much more comprehensive. If you go to the next slide, this is one of the first um, dashboards you might be looking at. What we said is we expand the data model. We're going to give you more information about your, about your um, environment than what the typical backup uh, product cares about. One of the extensions to the data model is a geographical representation of all of your assets. So what you see here is a quick view across your environment if you have a very large environment. Those pins recognize assets, configuration items. This might be clients you're protecting, might be server environments you're backing up to, or might be both, right? Green 
is a color code indicating there's activity in those areas. That means there's currently a backup or restore replication going on. Red would indicate that you've got a trouble there. There's one of those arrows up there is being um, associated to that. Blue is an indication that you have nothing going on, it's idle. The thinking behind it is, why do we go there? I mean, one, it's cool looking, and you know, I like looking at that. But the other, more important reason is, today when you're asked as a, as a backup administrator to take an action in a specific data center, let's say you have problems with the network in your, in your New York data center, and you're asked to pause backups because they're generating too much load. Now you're going to have to navigate through a list of servers, and you have to remember which server is located where, find the appropriate job, and stop it, right? What we're going to show you is you have different flow view operations here where you can actually go up here, select a certain location, and take action on this location. So it really allows you to be much more efficient in administrating in the way we probably interact more frequently with it, which is like, I want to take action on a certain location. If you go to the next slide, <coughs> we also incorporate the cloud. We do recognize that lots of the environments are now partially in the cloud. It could be that you're hosting some of your machines in a, in a cloud environment like a rec space or a service, which is just your servers. It could be that you're utilizing some of the Salesforce or other SaaS offerings out there, or you're having some online storage sitting in Amazon, for example. So realistically, the geographical representation is not covering all of your environment anymore. Some of it will be sitting in the cloud. XA will at um, Further down the road, we'll have interfaces, the cloud gateway we talked about. It's not part of release one, but will come shortly thereafter. Where we're going to tie in those cloud assets and really going to make those manageable through the XA interface. So would you not want to um, <coughs> be able to show location within there as well? Though? Because yes. some of those would have be physical. Be, you know, yeah. physical so what we, what we, what we envision to do is once you select, for example, you know, any one of those clouds and you click on it, you can drill down and you get more information of what's hosted inside there, if we have location information of this is in EMEA or in Europe and this is in the US, okay. you're going to get that too. If you go to the next slide, and we're going to stop with these slides in just a second and we are right into the live demo. This is the other most important thing and I'm, I'm very dear to my heart. We talked about services, not infrastructure. This is our attempt of allowing you to group your services, right? If you want to look at your financial system today, you have to know all of the servers, all of the databases, all of the things that belong to it. This is another extension to the data model where you can create groupings where you see this is all of what belongs to my financial systems. And now you can take action on those. You can create SLAs, you can create policies on it, you can start jobs, you can stop jobs based on the filtering. You can take specific actions. It allows you to manage your target SLAs based on the grouping. If you want your financial data to be separated from everything else, it's fairly easy in that scheme. So it's really an attempt to get to representing the world the way an IT professional wants to look at it, not the way the infrastructure is laid out. You, you shouldn't be bothered by the wiring underneath. What you're interested in is what service do you want to protect and how. Does it map interdependencies with an application then? Like if you have like a three-tier app and I'll kind of say this is what I all need to back up to meet this SLA? So there, there will be different shades of gray in that and that will get more intelligent as we move forward with the XA platform because we are starting right now with is more of a manual grouping where we attempt, what we do is we basically input what you have today in your VRanger or NetVault environment, right? So all of the things you're protecting that you're going to import. I'm going to try to be smart about how we group those based on information we have. We're going to have to manually do this in the first place. Down the road, we want to fully couple into the ITIL configuration databases that might be present in your environment to input those and represent them in the same group. Because you've done the work once, we can basically leverage that off and allow you the grouping. Okay, but if we take a simple case like Exchange, yes. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then I need to back up the mailbox servers, I need to back up the SMTP right. gateway servers. Mm -hmm. I need to have, in order for that to work, I need right. Active Directory. So right. You have associations. So yes. I need to define. So I need to define all of those dependencies. There, are, there is actually quite a bit of data model in there, right? Right, right. I mean, in the in the purest configuration management sense, you know, from an ITIL speak, it's really a configuration management database. So the scope and the levels that we're introducing introduce CI categories and associations. So in many cases, as we're discovering, either we're loading up from the existing components, okay. or we can take a third party asset you know, inventory, and, repository. And ultimately, you'll build And ultimately, create the associations, we exactly. Things like exchange that are... Right. We do. Some of the things are inherent. Yeah, exactly. Some of them are just inherent, so you know what the associations is going to so be. So, 
but now I've created this exchange group mm -hmm. and I've got an SLA for it, and that includes Active Directory. Yeah. Right. I'm going to have 27 other groups that include Active Directory. Right. In a traditional backup application, that means I'm going to backup Active Directory way too many times. Mm -hmm. You're smart enough to say, because we backed it up as part of that group, that backup is recent enough to meet the SLA for this group? Mm -hmm. Or am I going to end up backing up Active Directory five times because i got five applications that are dependent on it? Right. We're smart enough to know the products that we're licensed for. We're smart enough to understand effectively what ultimately, if you, if you think of it like this, the SLAs ultimately are going to have inherent relationships to policies, and the policies are going to be tied to the CI category. So Exchange, for example, have a host of policies associated with restores, backups, replication, Active Directory, the same, and so forth. And those policies are available with either default settings in terms of influencing some of what you just talked about, or you can manually override them, or say for this RTO and this RPO and this SLA, with all these configuration items that are going to be associated with this group, here's how I want to treat it, and then depending on the products that are associated, the underlying default policies and maybe any overrides or changes that you want to make. So you can modify the frequency of individual configuration items if you want to, or recognize that, I'm yes. I'm kind of more hoping for it to be smarter than that. Yeah, right. I, I see where you're going. Right. The, the smartness, I want to be honest, I'm not sure if we have right now the answer if that's going to be in phase one. The point is, since we do recognize okay. the individual configuration items that are being protected and its protection status right. on, the, on the CI itself, Mm -hmm. We would be smart enough to say we are satisfied there. We don't need to do it again, right? That, that's really that's really what you're looking for. That's really what the framework allows it today. I'm not sure if the rules engine has that logic in okay. day one because we have a rules well, engine built into that. But know. it's a very ex it's an excellent point. I, I like the idea. It, from the data model, it's fully supported. It's a question of for us coding a rule for it. Yeah. Make sure yeah. we don't, don't do it twice. You know, actually, I think I, I, I touched on most I want to touch on. I really want to get over to the person with the driver's license for you to say and <laughs> get, gets to operate on it, um, which I yet got to credit it to. We, we can stop with the slides, go to the live demo, show, show some of those operations. I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to get you introduced to some of the screens so we're not getting lost as we walk through it and you have a little bit of familiarity with it. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, going to hand it right over to you, Bob. Okay, so great, thanks. So I'll just walk you first through just a navigation of how the UI is laid out, just to give you some appreciation. Um, a little bit of background. Um, what, this is a active. This is a release that's currently going through the dev cycle. So we're targeting the fall, and it incorporates the middleware piece and obviously the back end stubs. You know the interfaces to the products. What I'm showing you right now is really just more of the front end. So it's not stubbed in or hooked into the middleware at all. Okay. You know, so, but it's real UI code. It's real CSS3, HTML5. It's AJAX based. It, you know, has, you know, stubbed in for the underlying calls. So it's just a that there's, it's a prototype. There's no active, you know, flow through, you know, end to end. But it is a browser that's coming over VPN. So it's not right. slides. Right. <laughs> so, uh, on the left here, just to give you a quick navigation, across the top we've got a global header, and the global header has a dashboard with K, you know, KPIs and various kinds of actions that are persistent across all of the different screens. The left here is really the piece I want to focus on first. We have a cloud view, we have a global view, uh, we have these group view and a, and a composite view. So depending on your orientation, you can navigate down if you want to look at it from a cloud perspective, which is really my you know, the business SaaS uh, environments that I currently are provisioned to me that I subscribe to that are under protection, the public infrastructure as a service in which I have either some cloud compute or cloud storage that are associated under protection. Down in the global view becomes more of a physical geographic perspective. So, uh, and, you know, question that wasn't asked is are you going to have any geospatial kind of, you know, automated mapping? Initially, no. We're, we're looking at it. We're, we're looking at the feasibility it. of it, yeah, but it's not something initially that we're going to introduce. But I'm sorry. What? Yeah, I, I just realized that I forgot to mention one thing. The question usually comes up <clears throat> as you start looking at this, how are we going to charge for this, right? I don't want to get this out right away. We're not. So what you're seeing here, once we release the products that are coming out later this year that are XA enabled, we will have XA as part of the package. And all the functionality you will see here is included in the products, right? So if you are current or maintenance and you upgrade to the next version of your beloved Quest data protection product, this thing comes with it, right? Okay, and if I'm now a V-Ranger customer, mm -hmm. then I'm going to buy a Netvolt XA 
No, there's no buying X8. The next time you upgrade to the appropriate V-Ranger uh, release, which is 6.0, which is an Able 2 X8, it has X8 in the package. Okay. When you install it, you have two options. You can say, you know, do you want to use X8? Yes. Do we already have an install of X8? Yes, then it's going to register with the already existing install since it can monitor multiple instances. If no, you can deploy one. Okay, and, and, and then if I want to back up physical servers, I've got to add a network. Then this. you need to uh, obtain a network license and set up the environment, and the network will do the same thing. It's going to ask you, do you have XA? Yes. Do you want to use it? Yes. Point me to it, I'm going to register, and it goes into the same framework. Okay. Yeah, the thing that we wanted to be very mindful of is not being disruptive to the operation of the organization. You know, they've got their processes, scripts, roles, a whole bunch of things. Cost is critical, so we want to be you know, very graceful, introduce it, make it optional, keep your existing UI, your existing user experience, and then you can start to leverage and take advantage of it and migrate as you, especially as you hook in other products. So the global view, as I mentioned, gives you the color status pins that represent different locations. You can drill down into each, I'll do that in a second, and then as I mentioned, the business view, the semantics, as Walter referred to, uh, are really up to you. If you want them to represent a business service, and you want to aggregate or associate all the configuration items, great. If you want it to be a technical service, you may want it to be all my Linux servers that are on the East Coast or everything associated with the HR organization. You know, again, the semantics are really up to you in terms of how you want to drive it. So back to the global view, some of the operations that you can walk through that Walter referred to, uh, looking across the top, I've got some aggregate status here that just very quickly gives me a sense for the total throughput that I'm experiencing for what I'm protecting. Uh, 200 terabyte here has given me a sense for the total available data that's available for restoration, whether it's been backed up or replicated, but it's the total, total data set. The available media uh, that's, that's, that's currently available for, uh, as a target for protection, uh, and then just an aggregated, you know, accumulated total uh, data that's currently under protection, all data that's been backed up uh, or replicated. So it's just giving me some high-level numbers that source, change. Source data. Exactly, okay. source data. And then these change, these, these numbers change depending on which geography, which location, et cetera, that I, that I, that I navigate to. The job activity, pretty self-explanatory in terms of different statuses. I walk over to the right and I start having flow through operations. So I can start going through scenarios like, uh, let me grab, you know, I'm interested in looking at what's in North America. Uh, and then I'm interested in, yeah, it's a little bit slow here interested in looking at maybe everything that's in an idle state. Um, maybe I want to grab, you know, uh, all of the systems associated with the financial group. And at this point, uh, you know, there's a variety of scenarios. It could be that maybe there's some natural phenomenon that's going to affect the, uh, you know, the southeast. And I want to quickly initiate a backup from a protection point of view. You know, another scenario that you could be looking at is uh, I'm doing end of quarter close. And I want to take all my bronze configuration items are under protection, I want to pause them all so that I'm re freeing up resources you know, to handle some of the workload. In this case, I'm going to say I want to do a backup for everything that's gold. Uh, it's going to give me visibility to the, ultimately the jobs that are going to be initiated based on the policies associated with the configuration items. I can view them to get some visibility to source and target, uh, estimated run times because I've accumulated some history related to you know, previous backups and restores. So it gives me some visibility in terms of what the overall Total, you know, total time is going to be. Uh, make a decision to select it. See that I've now turned into a green. I've got jobs that are active. Flip up a card to give me some quick visibility to, you know, um, ultimately the number of CIs that are involved being protected or that are targets, SLAs, underlying jobs that are currently active. I can see I got five jobs that are running. Hit the information, and now I get those same metrics, but specific to Atlanta. So at that point, I can take further action uh, specific to that site. If I want, uh, move over into the SLA, I can see I've got five jobs associated with the gold SLA. Uh, I can go up to my job activity up at the top and say, uh, I'd like to get some visibility more from a, you know, a, a total job associated with all job activity with respect to Atlanta. So I can look at kind of a cinema view, and I can go into each any of these cards and then specific jobs and, and, and further uh, manipulate some control. Uh, here I can drill down into uh, more of a network topology view if I want to see now the associations between uh, all of the different configuration items related to Atlanta. Uh, I have activity spinners that are giving me a sense for which configuration items have some kind of flow that's occurring or some kind of throughput. I can see I've got 100, you know, 100 uh, I can look at our deduplication repository if I want to see based on those jobs total, what kind of activity is actually flowing. 
just again, just to give me further validation, the ability to get, you know, inspect and also to drive additional control if, 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 if I feel that that's necessary. You know, there's other, you know. So right now this is, in, in version 1.0, this is going to be limited to the stuff that's under your direct control, right? Correct. So Correct. I've got a data domain in New York that replicates to a data domain in LA, and I have seen that relationship here. In, in, in the current interface, no. We would have to expand the knowledge of our um, XA platform, and yeah. we recognize that. And, and link into the APIs, then you would. Yeah. And that, that's actually not a good point, just, just real quick. Mm -hmm. Like I said, XA is more than, than just this GUI and the single pane of glass. It actually has you know, the configuration database we talked about. It, it also has um, rules engines in there that basically allow you certain things we're going to show you. And it's also a, a very um, easy way for us to create new functionality like such, a, such as a plugin for data domain, right? If you want to know what's going on in data domain, if that's something you want to explore down the road, that will be something we probably just bolt into the intelligent uh, bus in there rather than trying to, you know, force fit it into one of the existing applications. Yeah, because if I'm, I'm going to have a, an SLA that says I want this data protected and off-site. Mm -hmm. Right, then exactly. You know, right. I should be able to know that regardless of who's responsible for making it possible. That's right. right. And so that's really what, what we want to um, enable with the XA platform here. A mm -hmm. couple of other yeah. uh, user experience. We want to ensure that we're bringing you static and interactive content, social media type content as well as you're interacting here, looking at product pages, knowledge base, online documentation, uh, or being able to manage patch versions, license, if you want to go out and pull down additional license and push them out to the underlying NetVault clients, maybe the Oracle application plugin module, and you want to grab it from here, select it, and then push that out. Down below, we want to hook people into our Quest data protection communities so that they're interacting with their peers, as well as our online chat from a support point of view. So we really want to get you that you know, single experience, you know, single pane of glass, so to speak. Um, looking over at the group view, uh, now I'm starting to, you know, get visibility to how I've organized or associated my CIs and I want to be thinking through, you know, uh, my HR systems. Uh, I don't have any SLAs. I see the protected CIs. I see the target CIs. I don't have any job activities. So I'm going to go over CIs? here. Uh, configuration items. So just ultimately the representation things. of the things that I'm protecting <laughs> or the thing I'm <laughs> using to protect it. Right. <laughs> Uh, I walk into the service level agreement wizard and here it gives me quick visibility along the left pane uh, based on the different service levels which are configurable in terms of what they're called, uh, how many I've got, how many are active, inactive. In this case I see I got an exchange backup SLA it's tied to one particular group which involves five protected configuration items. I can very quickly look at, uh, at a glance at, at a summary page. Uh, and at this point I'm looking at my HR group so I want to create a new SLA. I'm going to collect, uh, select on the, on the SLA creation uh, icon here. I'm just walking through an accordion type wizard. So I'm going to specify whatever RPO I want, whatever RTO I want, walk through. Uh, at this point, I see all my target CIs. I happen to be looking at a replication SL, uh, SLA for offsite replication. Uh, here, the, you know, for this VC, I've got you know, a handful of VMs. Uh, and in this particular case, we want to put some intelligence in it so that based on the RTO and the RPO you set, it guides you through the target CIs mm. so that you don't get yourself into trouble. So in other words, the event that you, oh, yes? It'd be good also to have a, a charge back or a, a show of the cost of what of the, is on, the, on the previous screen. Mm -hmm. So if you get some crazy guy in there that wants it recovered in a minute that he knows what the heck it's in. It. Right, the right. Th this was one of the things yep. that we have on the roadmap. Yeah. Well, it's not in release one. But it's definitely something we keep in mind besides the fact that it's also going to be a multi-tenant interface where you have a role space access to. So mm -hmm. this, this experience here is really something that goes beyond the back of admin. That's something where you could see you know, somebody who is uh, responsible for a certain part of the environment, an Oracle database or an exchange environment. They should be able to self-serve on you, right? They will get restricted access to what they're responsible for because one of the things you'll see there's an owner associated to items. No. So based on that configuration, you will be able to be limited to what you're responsible for. So multiple aspects. One, we want to make it multi-tenant in case you know, you're an MSP right. and you have an, um, a need to expose it to certain groups that can't overlap, right? Uh, we want to have a role-based uh, access where you can expose this to IT professionals that are outside of the backup infrastructure, you know, allow them to experience the value of it. 
And on top of that, we thought about the chargeback and the metering of it to really give you an idea of you know, how expensive is it to configure that, that super SLA, right? It's all gold. Mm -hmm. They can't choose it, right? right. Um, but that I don't think we have in version one, right? It's no, it's not in version one. But it's definitely part of the scope. It is. In fact, I'll, I'll go back to that cloud view. On that cloud view, that global header, header, we actually had an icon provision there to be able to go into a cost model and be able to look at, or in some cases, be able to plug in how you want to be apportioning costs, but especially with the cloud view, since much of it is variable based, you know, and it's apportioned, you know, indirect, some of it's direct, some of it's indirect. We really want to, and recognize, you've got to get visibility to that so that you don't you get yourself in real trouble. Uh, especially when you're going down here and you're saying, I'm going to target this configuration item for a replication, and at this level, to your point, giving some visibility to say, well, what does that mean? What's what, that, what's that going to do for me? What is that item at the bottom that's grayed out? Yeah, so this is actually where, where I was going ultimately with my earlier comment, is the intelligence to say, based on the RTO that you just specified, this is grayed out because it's not capable of supporting that particular RTO. And we have some history based on, again, you know, the latency, the I.O. rates, the things for backup, replication, restores yeah. that we're able to accumulate. So we're able to give you a little bit of deductive reasoning to say, we're graying it out, but we're going to put the override in there because obviously, you know, you may know best. You may have desire, you know, to actually push it out there anyway. But regardless of backup, in this case, it's a cloud replication. Um, so we're graying it out. And then to Walter's point, coming down here and being able to then specify, you know, the additional owners. Say, yep, it looks good. Now at this point, we want to streamline the user experience so that you don't have to go through all the detail. I mean, if you want to do the SLA, it's as simple as here's the group, here's the SLA and just walk through you know, the, the accordion screens to say, I'm good. But in this case, if you do want to see the underlying detail for the policies that are going to be activated associated with those particular configuration items, we want to give you visibility. So you can look and see, based on these infrastructures of service uh, cloud, the CI category, I've got three replication policies tied to these VMs. If I want, I can specify, you know, I can change uh, any of the destination associated actions with the policy because we're really looking at the policies as being an object. Okay. So it has state, it has condition, it has action, and it's tied to a configuration item. And then you can whip into the policy editor if you want to actually go and modify that. At, so. at the moment, I assume when you guys say replication, you need replicate backup data. Correct. That's correct. Okay. Yep. So at this point, I've just had, you know, I've, 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 I've hit OK for that particular well, SLA. You know, since, I'm sorry to yep. interrupt. Since, yep. since you did touch on it, <clears throat> Part of the Quest portfolio is also SharePlex, which is more of a live replication of Oracle databases for HA. SharePlex, as well as Recover Manager, and all of the other assets that we consider part of the data protection portfolio will roll into the XA platform down the road. So yeah. today it's backup data, mm -hmm. but down the road we're going to take advantage of other Quest assets, and so it might extremely expand, right? right. Yeah, even the CDP, you know, is different than CDP right. is also different. Yeah. Than back than replicating backup data. Right, that's right. right. And CDP is probably also one of the newer ones to get into that XA umbrella, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, and Lightspeed because yep. absolutely that's the whole, right. The whole idea that you have this really good backup for SQL Server and Exchange, right? And you have this general purpose backup with agents right. for SQL and Exchange that for Oracle and, Exchange and SQL Server that. Good. Right. Yeah. right. The backup, the that's compression. Right. Exactly. And, and that's yeah. really, it, it makes it easier to consume all of those best of breed applications Quest has, right? right. Because Cause, today they're a little bit disjoint. With this, it's actually going to be one, it's, it's a unified way to interact with them. You don't have to relearn really your language and you know, understand how this tool works versus the other. This is going to bridge the gap for you. And on top of that, you know, if you license to all of the products, like I said, down the road, we're going to try to be smart about and suggest it for you. So we're going to suggest you use this product for this protection, right? Because right. this is what you specify, and we're going to deploy it that way. So here, I've, you know, I've, I've accepted the SLA, and now, you know, the appropriate replication jobs have kicked off. We're introducing an analytic, uh, you know, on-demand or scheduled uh, reporting dashboard capability as well. So we want to give you uh, the ability to look at your SLA compliance. Uh, media status job summary, in this particular case, I'm looking at the SLA compliance. I've got some dimensions here that I can go in and say, what's the category SLA I want to see, the type of SLA, uh, some of the temporal things related to, to, to time. Uh, I, can, uh, I can go down and we want to provide additional recommendations. In this case, I'm looking at SLA compliance. So based on 
various kinds of you know, insight, information that we've gathered, provide you some additional recommended findings uh, according to different areas, as well as other related reports that you can centrally view. Before you move off the screen, just want to point yeah. out, keep the SLA here. Notice the difference. We're not talking about success of your backups, we're talking about SLAs. Now, there's actually two components to it. One is you have enough recovery points, which means you had the backups and the frequency you needed them to. But more importantly, based on what we know about the current status of your infrastructure, you'll be able to restore them. Which means if the media goes offline, which hosts a couple of the data you've backed up, your SLA would be in violation, right? You have backup data, but you can't restore it now because that media is offline. And you could, you could continue running backups to just go to a different media pool, right? Right. But you will get the alert here that you're in violation of a certain SLA and it's going to alert you on both ends, which I think is an extension of what we do today. Anything about how badly? Why don't you click on it? Because if sure. I barely missed my SLA, I'm less concerned than if That's I've right. blown it completely. Right. If it's and, and I think yeah, you know, the way it's, it's reporting on it, if you click on one of those bubbles, it's going to tell sure. just hover over the thing, it's going to pop something up here, right? Oh, right. Take that Here's how much you missed it, right? Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when There's some additional <laughs> guidance, right? Yeah. Yeah, because it's not binary. <laughs> no, it's not right. binary. And that's, I believe there's even a yellow shade, not just a red. But <laughs> if you miss it, is there a way to not inform the application on it? <laughs> <laughs> if there would be, I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got, you've got role-based administration. You don't give the application owner access to the screen. Right. I mean, that's the whole premise is, we want to cater to whether you're the CIO, whether you're a business, business user, you're the director, the manager, a We're DBA, the or the back of admin. So anyway, that's just some visibility, and then of course, you know, all the mechanisms that you would expect: print, save, share. You know, you you, you name it, related to the analytics and the reports uh, that we provide you. Uh, so uh, with that, there's some additional scenarios we can go through. I think but the I Seattle think one. Why can we go through the Seattle one? That, that is a good one. Which one? Oh, the Seattle one? Oh, sure. So, you know, at the same time we're driving you towards this service level user experience, we also recognize there's scenarios where you just, you know, you're, you're, you're an enlightened IT admin, you just want to log in and say, you know what, I just want to create a job. Right. You know, I love doing the SLAs, love getting that visibility. But I'm about to but you know the what? server and I want to back up just in case I screw it up. I just want to go initiate a job. Maybe one time, maybe triggered by an event, or maybe I just want to schedule it. So we want to give you that full, you know, suite of, of, of use case or scenarios. So in this case, I've got, uh, in Seattle, for example, uh, I've got a set of, uh, of configuration items that, that, are, that are currently configured. I've got a payment database down here. I go in and I want to just essentially walk through, again, an accordion wizard that, in this case, the payment database is plugged in the or Oracle application plugin module for NetVault. So it's giving me visibility for my database. And then what do I want to back up? What table space? And then I could just walk through based on how I want to specify the appropriate arguments. So here I'm looking at the destination configuration item of where I want to essentially protect it to, uh, backup method. Uh, I can continue on looking at scheduling so I can lay out based on the windows, look at existing you know, jobs that have run, uh, and then you know, specify whether it's triggered, is it one time, is it repeating, uh, and then just continue on into advanced options in the event that there's certain, you know, I want uh, duplicates or you know, copies or what have you. Uh, and then uh, walk into, finally, just a, a quick synopsis of the options and the configuration that I've just, uh, I've just specified uh, for, for that particular database. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks. So at that point, yeah, it looks good. So I want to accept it. I get visibility that I've kicked off a one-time job. My activity spinner is showing me, yep, I've got that backup occurring. So we want to give you that visibility in the event that, you know, or that option in the event you want to, you, you know, you, you want to go there uh, as, a po as opposed to the SLAs. Frankly, I think this is a little cute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with that said, you know, we, we're approaching the end of our 45 minutes and we want to give you some time to ask questions for us. What do you all think? Is it too cute? <laughs> there's a, there's a couple of I pieces like of there are a couple of pieces of it that are too cute. The idea, you know, especially if you're Quest and you, mm -hmm. you know, but this could be just as true of Semantic with their portfolio through acquisitions. Right. It's you know, let's tie all this crap together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. And yeah. you know, it's, and it's, I, it's I've never made it a secret that NetVault was not my favorite product. 
I, I think their real power is like when it becomes any backup solution to this. Then you can do anything. So I, I want to be very clear right now, we're targeting cross products, right? So if, if there's, I've heard this before, you're going to monitor uh, other backup products, the answer is no right now. This is really our way of um, allowing you to interact with the Quest assets. Especially since you're not charging for it. You We're not charging for it now. <laughs> and the other thing is, keep in mind, you know, you, you pointed out Quest has made some acquisitions to get here. Quest might make acquisitions in the future. This is a very realistic scenario, right? <laughs> so this is really the platform where we're going to tie things together, right? So as we move forward, as we either produce new things ourselves or we, we end up acquiring assets also uh, for acquisition, this is going to continue to be the same. So what we wanted to do is really create a user experience where whether you use the simplest part of the Quest Data Protection portfolio we have today or might own in the future, or you get into the most complicated scenario where you have worldwide data centers, you have the same user experience. You don't need to relearn the language of how you interact with our products, whether you, um, let's say, <coughs> um, a reseller or, or somebody who's doing professional services. Once you've learned this, you can use it for any one of those assets down the road. So that's really the idea. Because right now, we're exposing you to a lot of different details, right? If you're more of an SMB product, you know, this is working this way and it's this terminology. Now you're, you're growing up and you, you go to the next enterprise level. Now we make you learn a new language, right? Because we name everything different and it looks all different. Just because I have to back up exactly, I have to learn my backup. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to keep it the same, right? This experience is going to stick with you. And the nice thing is this Google, this particular interface, like we said, we recognize today people are not glued to their desks anymore. I mean, you know, right now we sit in front of a, a laptop, many times we don't. Many times we're just on the way, we might have an iPad or some similar device or even just an iPhone. And, you know, for the fun of it, one of our SCs has gone out of his way to send me a little video how he kicked off backups in New York from his iPhone. <laughs> so it, it actually does work. It's not yet optimized for the iPhone. We really look more on the tablets because we think you need to have a little bit of screen and real estate to really make it work. Right, right. But if you're really hard pressed, you get the call in the middle of the night and say, you know, got to run a backup right now and you're in the restaurant and go like, you know, you can manage. It's not the best user experience, but you can make it happen. And that's really what we're trying to do is, you know, make it easy, guide people through the process, keep the experience consistent no matter which asset you are trying to use out of the Quest portfolio. Whether you just start off small and had a small uh, world to worry about and through some changes, either organic growth or acquisition, it grew to be bigger and you have a bigger problem to worry about, this is going to stick with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You Thanks, Bob.